Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to um, another episode of, or another meetup for Austin Software Cooperatives. Um, today is Wednesday, April the 7th, 2021, and your usual intro guy is going to be presenting today. So, um, yeah, let's let's get into it. Um, today we're talking about a book named by the name of How Markets Fail, The Logic of Economic Calamities by John Cassidy. We've prepared a mind map, and um, this is going to be pretty conversational today. Um, I think it's, it's best because this book goes over a lot of economic history, concepts, definitely opinionated, which is by the nature of economics, but um, I think it's fun. And to tie everything back, um, we, we like to keep everything in perspective. Um, this is a cooperative meetup. And so um, if we have time at the end uh, throughout discussion, I'd like to see if we can go through maybe a thought experiment um, of cooperatives. I came up with it just to initiate conversation but um without any further ado i guess let's get into the um the book so how markets sell okay here we go here's a link to the mind map uh you should have that um if not you can find that in the um meetup later if you're viewing the recording and so here we go just now starting out um how Markets Fell was written by John Cassidy. He's been writing about Wall Street and finance since 87. Before coming to New York, he was the business editor of the Sunday Times in London, where he was known for his brilliance and economic, as an economic historian. And he, he regularly invites us to move beyond the daily headlines and think about, a way, about the way modern capitalism operates and about theories that formed economic policy. And so in short, um, as a quick summation, this book, in, in my words, was essentially a story of how the combination of deregulation and financial markets and low interest rates inspired the nation's top banks to take on excessive leverage via risky financial instruments that would eventually lead to the Great Recession. That was a mouthful. He talks about a lot more than that, but I think those are the highlights. Um, and so um, I think a good way to start, um, I've outlined like today's meetup in just a few different sections um, where we effectively um, start out with the context. What are we talking about here? Um, where, what's the scene um, and this economic dilemma that he is um, approaching? What's the problem with this context? I have listed like an example of the problem um, in practice, his call to action to solve the problem, and um, also my cooperative application, AKA thought experiment. And so, like I said, um, I'll be stopping between each section uh, for just discussion. And so let's, let's dive in, I'm excited. Um, Essentially, the context of this is free markets and utopian economics. What, a free, what, a, what is the free market? Uh, the free market was like originally popular, popularized by Adam Smith, um, and he was best known for his coined term of the invisible hand. Um, in short, leave the market alone. Everyone, the market will solve itself because people have natural incentives to pursue utility, happiness, and feed themselves. And so there is an invisible hand that will always move them, correct the market and um, fix any short-term blips or problems that may occur. And so um, the, uh, what still holds true today and there are many 
that is taught in every beginner economic class or, and I mean, this leads to even PhD candidates and practicing economists, um, many of whom adopt the ideology of a free market and subscribe to it. Um, some of note are Hayek, Friedman, Lafar, uh, Keith, uh, Sir Keith Joseph, um, Milton Friedman, uh, Hayek, uh, especially those two I'm familiar with, very influential. I'm sure Arthur Lafar and Sir Keith Joseph are um, are uh, pretty influential in their own right since they got shout outs in the book. Um, however, there is a heavy emphasis on Milton Friedman. Um, a whole chapter and he's mentioned throughout the book. He is a um, diehard Adam Smith free market subscriber and takes it several steps further than even Smith. Um, so really quick, Three uh three points that are that just stand out are about what what's good about free markets. One is the division of labor. Um, essentially, uh, people specializing in what they do best and um, encouraging that specialization. You know, it's going to lead to big productivity growth just through that efficiency there. Um, the second is that it encourages innovation. If you innovate and produce something which people want to buy, you generally make a profit, and at least for a while. And so um, innovation almost seems like a natural next step from specialization. You know how to do something very well, then you eventually get better at get better at it, and uh, at least that essentially is innovation. Um, and um, the third aspect of free markets is that you don't need a central planner. The market is a coordination mechanism. And when you think about that, we take it for granted, but that leads to essentially, I mean, that's a, that's a good summation of, 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 my, of our initial definition of what a free market is. Another way is, uh, we'll talk about that later, is the, uh, uh, the French term laissez-faire, uh, let it be. Um, and so uh, if, if we move to utopian economics right here at the bottom, and you know, I even mentioned essentially, and this may be over centralized, oversimplified, but it's the true realized ideal of the free market. Um, an observation taken from the book is while utopian economics is based on the idea that people know their own best interests, um, it assumes that they have all the information they need and can understand it. And so, whereas an Adam Smith um, day, which is I can't call the year, but it was uh, about 200 years ago, um, I believe. But the world was a much simpler one with not as complex financial markets and and financial institutions and, um, pro and instruments that are used today. And um, things were a lot more simpler, um, albeit economics is by no, uh, you know, it's nowhere close to simple. Um, things where it was a, it was, it was a lot easier to for people to know their own interest. And so, uh, Edward Grimlich, that was a, it was a very keen observation. Um, but so I'll just stop here before we get into what I have as a myth of utopian economics. Does anyone have any comments or questions about anything? Uh. Sure. I got a quote from Smith that, because everybody, I like how he highlighted <clears throat> Smith, um, because everyone, or economists and other people, tend to quote some of these authors, Smith, Hayek, and then they actually don't read them. So here's a here's an interesting quote: In the Wealth of Nations, Smith listed three duties of government as the three duties of uh, government as defending the nation, administering justice, and erecting and in maintaining certain public works and certain public institutions, which it could never be for the interest of any individual or small numbers of individuals to erect and maintain, because the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals. 
though it may frequently do much more than repay it to a great society. So that third, where it says that it needs uh, the government also erects and maintains certain public works and public institutions, which can never be for the interest of any individual. That one is one that nobody ever quotes. So the whole <laughs> laissez-faire thing is, it's not an Adam, Adam Smith thing. Mm. Oh, and, and, and so I'll, I'll add to that um, exactly what you're saying. I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, so I could go straight to it. It's page 75 in the evangelist uh, chapter. Uh, well, uh, Friedman essentially cites Adam Smith, just as you said. However, uh, he takes a much more conservative uh, approach for um, government intervention. And so he actually argues, um, just as you said, against um, public uh, goods. So public education, um, highway construction, um, any type of public project. Um, essentially, he's against Social Security, public housing, minimum wage, um, the list goes on. But um, even national parks. Effectively, if the people want it bad enough, then the market will pay for it. And so um, he goes a, a lot further than Smith, but um, I mean, he's actually, he was the man for a good while. Um, I think it was uh, Reagan. Um, but um, yeah, and so utopian economics is effectively the world in which uh, the free market works. The um, any problem that occurs, it's just a blip in the grand scheme of things. No big deal. Just, you know, a little error. The market will correct, correct itself. We don't have to do anything. Just give it time. Um, and so it's like uh, <laughs> even that, that time can hurt because when we saw what happened with the Great Depression. Um, a couple of excerpts I have here that just kind of outline that myth of utopian economics. Um, essentially, um, with using free markets and approaching problems um, with that free market ideology, uh, you can have severe consequences. And so, um, Cassidy um, essentially articulates the misapplication of the free market ideology, of a pure free market ideology. He um, focused on Greenspan a lot, which was the chairman of the Fed for about two decades, uh, or a little more, from 87 to 2006, um, who was a diehard, um, as Cassidy would say, uh, subscriber to utopian economics. But um, it was a misapplication of um, that ideology to financial markets um, via the lenses of rational expectations and the rational expectation and the efficient market hypothesis. Um, and it just, those models are, once you get into speculative markets, it just doesn't work. And so, um, and I, I guess it can work, but once you, um, combine it with the perfect storm of deregulation and um, unmanaged or mismanaged monetary policy with the results in low interest rates, it, um, these, um, these hypotheses fall a bit short. And so um, I think that we can speak a bit more about that um, once we go to the problem. Um, and so the framework, the the scenario in the real world here that he is really outlining, there are several reasons for market failures. Um, the one here that we focus on in this book is um, speculative, um, a speculative uh, uh, market failure. Um, and so the... Um, with that, with that in mind, we can talk about rational irrationality. 
And so my loose definition, which I have up top, is individual incentives that produce spillover, quote unquote spillover, that's taken from the economist uh, Pagu, and thus hurts the economy. Worst case scenario, case in point, the market can fail, or a market can fail. Um, Retolts, something else in that, right? He also wrote in a sort of a loose definition and exa example as well. Um, Cassidy cites him in one of his articles on The New Yorker that rational irrationality asks us to ignore the repercussions of our behaviors. We can rationalize short term gains at the expense of long term losses because we need to obtain quarterly profits regardless. Um, examples of this. Um, from the book and in the real world um, concerning the uh, financial, uh, the Great Recession of 2007-2008, Prince um, was the CEO of uh, City. And so he conceded that a full-scale blow-up of subprime um, loans could cause liquidity to dry up in other asset-backed security markets, leaving City and other banks saddled with numerous loans of questionable value. Still, he insists that City had no intention of pulling back. He said the depth of, to of pools of liquidity is so much stronger now than it used to be, and the destructive event now needs to be much more destructive than it used to be. At some point, the destructive event will be so significant that its liquidity, instead of filling in, will go the other way. I don't think we're at that point. As long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. Um, Effectively, as Cassidy wrote, once people in the financial sector come to believe that government will cap their losses, they have incentive to step up their risk taking. And so Prince, along with many others, knew the level of risk they were taking on. They knew what could happen, however, uh, to the rest of the market and what the fallout could be. Um, however, they were making extraordinary profits. And that is rational for them. I mean, it's very rational uh, from a personal incentive uh, viewpoint. Um, however, the irrational part comes with the spillover that affects not only them, but you know the local, state, community, country, and even the world. And so, um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Uh, does anyone have any feedback or questions? Rational irrationality. Yeah, he. I think he, Prince. That was Citigroup, and he. I think he got fired or resigned after that. Yeah, four months after that quote. Yeah. Yeah. They were um. It was like a massive that. amount of debt. Talking about reputation, and it's better to make a bad decision that everyone else thought was a good decision than it is to make a good decision and be right when everyone else thought you were wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially if in um, shorter term, it looks like you're wrong and then you lose your job. It doesn't matter if later on you were right and the market shifted in the direction you were saying. And so the, the irrational part would be that social side of the long-term view looks like you, everyone should have done it, but it's more rational to just follow the herd, whether you're doing it for reputation only, or you're someone kind of like what um, Prince was saying here, but the whole riding the wave, that would be for the all the pe people, it's not just reputation, but people making money off of the bubble, essentially riding the bubbles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's 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 what it, what they don't touch on is something you just hinted at is that um, the um, there is definite there's definite personal um, incentive for profits. However, um, let's say you were not irrational and you did do the rational thing, and like you suggested, Prince says, "Now I'm not gonna be crazy and." stop doing this, making money, our stock prices are going to fall, our investors are going to get angry, I'm going to look like a fool, I'll probably get let go, 
you know, but hey, you know, I would, I would help out the rest of the world. And that right there, being rational, they don't talk about that, that sacrifice. It's not only that you won't make money, but you're going to go into the negative as well, uh, potentially, at least in his case. Uh, one thing that I I would have rather I would have liked if he would have put in some of the hedge funds that basically predicted 2008 and shorted things and made money all that stuff and then played it saying that that in a way could break the market or not break the market at least comment on it because this guy lost but somebody else uh thought what he's saying said well you know the music's playing you gotta dance but you know what i think i'm gonna stop dancing right in 2007 in january <laughs> let's stop and there were people who did that there were hedge funds that did that and um i, I would like i would have wished he would have commented on those you know, saying, yeah. you know, it's a luck, not luck, whatever it is and all that stuff. There's so much stuff written on here with so many people saying, oh, we saw it, but <laughs> there's nothing we could have done or we, you know, or we saw it and we changed the direction and stuff like that. And we started shorting. I mean, there was a, <laughs> a view that some of the bigger, I want to say Goldman or some of the other ones were shorting. I don't know if it was um, uh, Morgan Stanley or some other things. This whole documentary on that, where they said, "Okay, someone came in and swooped and just killed them," and it was mysterious on who would have known that. So I don't know, but anyways, yeah, yeah, that would have been. I would have liked that because, like you said, he mentioned a few guys in here that says they predicted it and tried to warn people and no one would listen. But um, that's, uh, that would have been interesting to, uh, to see. Um, let me see, example of problem in practice, the Fed's poor management of monetary policy and deregulation of financial markets consistently throughout the 90s and 2000s led to government-backed banks choosing over leverage, over, choosing to over leverage the assets and speculative markets. And so we kind of just went into all of that. Um, so what is his call to action? Let's uh, dive into here. But I guess um, follow the market. Um, the, um, this is more repeating of what we said. Um, I, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it's important to say there's a couple mm -hmm. quotes I have here. Um, about what you're saying on this topic. So, okay. Because we're talking about who could, you just said, who could fail, who would predict, and all this stuff. And um, here's one. So, a quote from Smith uh, To prevent, okay, no, this is John Cassidy talking about Smith. To prevent a recurrence of credit busts, Smith advocated preventing banks. This is Adam Smith advocated preventing banks from issuing notes to speculative lenders. And this is the quotes. Mm. Such regulations may no doubt be considered as in some respects, a violation of natural liberty, but these uh, exertions of the natural liberty of a few individuals, which might endanger the security of the whole society are restrained by the laws of all governments of the most free as well as the most despotical. So, um, that's Smith saying that he had a problem with um, unregulated banks. And okay, so here's another quote. Adam, Alan Greenspan and other self-proclaimed descendants of Smith rarely mention his skeptical views on the banking system, which are shared by many 19th century economists who are otherwise main, who otherwise maintain a favorable view a favorable view of the free market. John Stuart Mill traced most economic downturns to disturbances that emerged from the financial system. So that's two, uh, you know, uh, quotes. John John Stuart Mill and um, Adam Smith both saying that regulation for banks, so government intervention, all that stuff. That's all. It, it was, it was, it was. Um, 
interesting. Greenspan was was a was an interesting guy as far as his um his approaches. I mean, he was definitely like you said, a student of Adam Smith or Friedman or whatever. Just the free market in general. Um, however, he was the chairman of the Fed, the organization created to like regulate um, the banking systems. And so um, it was somewhat like, a, and I mean, John Cassidy uh, commented on it being an, absurd, an absurdity that he would take such a laissez-faire or a, this market, this is a self-correcting approach when uh, he himself is supposed to be the one to take action and save the system from itself. And so, um, I don't know, I just thought his, his approach was a bit interesting. Uh, with this whole uh, Great Recession that we had. Um, and so this right here, we've already said this, uh, rational, the rational of individuals motivated by personal incentives, regardless of overall market effects. Yeah, so the, uh, effectively, I mean, I guess it's, it's important to say that um, John Cassidy doesn't blame one person, whether that's Greenspan or um, uh Fannie Mae or, you know, or any one person for the um, the fail of the market, but more so a combination and it's, it's a fail of the market itself. And that's what he's calling us to do to um, to change our perspective of the market and his call to action um, to prevent these things uh, going forward. The uh, three uh, main things that he's outlines as far as the cause for the 2007-2008 um, recession was the rational irrationality of individuals motivated by personal incentives regardless of overall market effects, the failure of governing regulators to responsibly regulate financial institutions in terms of, ledger, in terms of leveraging speculative markets, and the failure of monetary policy and economic analysis by the part of the Fed. Um, the um, John Cassidy's call to action is effectively reality-based economics, which uh, is is no um, is nothing to to laugh at once you um, figure out what he's asking you to do. Um, however, um, it can be traced back to two sources: um, the essentially behavior economics as well as Arthur Pagu's argument that many economic phenomena involve interdependencies. Effectively, what you do affects my welfare and what I do affects yours. And in fact, that's, that's, and that's a fact that the market often fails to take into account. Um, and so that, that, that sums up reality-based economics um, as, as uh, short as you can do it, but um, I mean to get more into it it's it's a it's it's an approach um where and i mean uh Watson, you may be able to to sum it up better but i'll I'll give it a crack a first shot and that's um what economics does what traditional economics does is it looks at it does not take into account irrational irrationalism or irrational people everyone is perfectly logical. It makes the right decisions in their best interest, no matter what. Um, however, we all know that that is not the real world. And so, um, I mean, effectively speaking, let's talk about the uh, rational rationality of Wall Street, um, of Wall Street's uh, over, -le over leveraging of speculative markets. Whereas, yeah, they made money, but I mean, everyone around them didn't and lost life savings, et cetera, the economy, the whole economy of the world suffered. Um, that wasn't rational. And people still did it. People do things in spite, to spite themselves for feelings and emotions all the time. It's a, it's a thing. And so to address that, you need psychology. You need, um, need other, you need behavioral sciences. You need social, um, you need uh, um, an understanding of um, 
uh, what is it? Social. I was gonna say socialism, not socialism, an understanding of uh, social sciences. I'll just say that effectively to um, predict the way people are acting and will act um, due to the market. And so um, that's his that's his view is effectively view the world and approach it as it is. And that's a tall order, effectively, because economics can get pretty um, complicated to understand in and of itself. But now you want people to understand um, philosophy and psychology as well, you know, pick up a Zizek book or something and so that they can understand human behavior. It, um, it makes it very hard. However, his assertion is that since it is not as fine-tuned and concretely defined as utopian economics or free market economics, whatever, um, it can apply and explain more uh, lips in the market, for lack of better words, and then th and therefore solutions to economic problems that arise. That was a lot. Can you, can you say that any better, Watson? Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, no, I'm not saying I, I think you did a good job with the thing I would my take away on what the book is about when he says how markets fail. I'm saying, OK, you know, tell me how markets fail and, and tell me you, you, you said a bunch their you know, rational rationality. One of the quotes that I like, I want to say his name is um, pronounced Peugeot, but um, the difference between social costs and private costs. So um, this guy said the key to, so he's talking about global warming and it's like the key to global warming, uh, and I'm sorry, this is stern, but it's based on Peugeot. The key to, the key to uh, global warming and the source of market failure that Stern was talking about is the presence of something that economists call negative spillovers or externalities. Another way of saying this is that social costs, the social costs of burning coal and other forms of carbon diverge from the private costs. So those two types of costs, they're not related directly. People have a different scale for them. Um, and we learned this in some of our older or other um, talks about fair, fairness and morality, so on and so forth, trying to put a, oh, like the Michael Sandel, you know, uh, a market book, trying to put a utilitarian quantity on certain things um, can't be done. Like what is the utilitarian value of cutting off your finger, or you know, that kind of thing. And you, you can't really do it. <clears throat> so that was like the downfall of utilitarian, pure to utilitarianism and <clears throat> the rise of people having an established set of underlying goals or, or principles um, that have, that aren't pure utilitarianism, um, uh, like the Bill of Rights. Um, those, that, that was like, um, a, a completely different view than pure utilitarianism. So in any case, uh, where markets fail, a big part to me, it spoke to me was that difference between the social and the private, and then people keep trying to unite them. Um, <clears throat> another portion was uh, the obsession of economists for trying to unite. It's kind of embarrassing that Mike macroeconomics, which is well, it's a, to, to summarize, we don't want another depression. You know, you have John Maynard Keynes, which mm -hmm. we didn't talk about too much. We don't want another depression. John Maynard Keynes came through and said, okay, here's some government interventions that we're going to do. Uh, and then considering that macro, not really concentrating on micro that much. And then everyone else on the micro side. So within industries, how, you know, different agents uh, operate, compete with each other, so on and so forth those two things, never the twain shall meet kind of thing. 
the discussion of that and then how it's kind of embarrassing it never really was united and it's kind of a uh a, it's kind of a um a way of describing or taking a jab at uh you obviously um are gonna fail at some point there needs to be failing would be some type of central planner needs to be involved um I would say even with even with Milton Friedman, even Milton Friedman, his claim to fame as far as policy goes, monetary policy, even he says, okay, you need someone raising interest rates to try to stop a recession or depression from happening. That was his plan. So he still says a central planner needs to be involved and the quasi government uh, agency is going to be the one doing it. Someone needs to be given, in, you know, given charge of that. And so you still, even with him, you still have it. He was just less liberal than um, a Keynes. All right. Keynes was like mm -hmm. all types of other create jobs, all that. He's like, well, let's just do monetary policy. It would have been nice for him to uh, been alive to answer for 2008 and just have all mm -hmm. of his, you know, responses for that. But, you know, or even right now, even right now to, to have him answer for, oh, well, We'll get those uh, vaccines going. We don't need we don't need any government help or any government provoking or anything like that. You know, but um, Milton Friedman at least tried to defend free markets. Um, Hayek, who's talked about a lot of the book, he um, when it comes to externalities or things medical or that, Hayek didn't even bother. He's just like, nah, I'm not interested. So um, I at least say, at least he, he, he tried to address it. Like he's honest, intellectually honest enough to try or say something. So uh, that's, that's my, my takeaways. Yeah, I would have loved to see, to know what Friedman had to say about 08. He, I think I believe he uh yeah uh, he dismissed it. Did he die in '06? I think. Um, but um, yeah, that would have been interesting. The um, uh, I guess we're almost. Does anyone else? Does anyone else have any comments about the book or anything? Uh, I think we have someone. Yeah, I was Go trying to raise it. my hand. Yeah, had to, I didn't know what the protocol is. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, you know, COVID has shown, I mean, the, this book, you know, the, another market failure or sort of a failure. I, I think one of you already mentioned this, but I mean, you know, if you look at all of the countries that have embraced neoliberalism the most over the past you know, period of time, they're all the ones with the highest rates of COVID and the complete dysfunctionality, the, uh, the inability to act together to solve a problem. Yeah, this is true. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. To, to, to speak a little bit that and to that, there's so much in the book, but um, one of my favorite uh, economist is Kenneth Arrow. And he, it's like, he's one of those guys. He tries to, to me, he tries to, uh, he's a kind of like hack the hackers type person. He's kind of a good guy. He's like a spy to me on, <laughs> on the side of the, of the people who, who um, kind of want to say to me, the people who are like brutal, pure, laissez-faire economics people, I, 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 just, I just find that maybe, I mean, some of them are, uh, I don't know what percent, what the spread would be, but some of them are well-meaning, but a lot of them to me are not. 
and Kenneth Arrow tries really hard <laughs> to um, create ways to bring back um, this um, the free market thinking. So he made a system, right? So you have Arrow's impossibility theorem and you have a bunch of other things that within game theory that are cool to me. But one of the things that he did was prove um, that within a uh, general equilibrium theory, like a, an updated version of it, that you could basically um, architect it and pick, basically pick winners and there will be no problem. The market will adjust. So the whole idea of the market is it, it adjusts to what you desire, what the, what the supply and demand, the intuition that he's saying is, okay, you want an equilibrium. We have a situation where no one can do better kind of thing. You can do that and still you can pick an equilibrium and the prices will adjust to the equilibrium that you pick. And so it's kind of, uh, it kind of killed the general equilibrium theory. Is that's, that's what, um, that's what, um, uh, Cassidy says, and that's from, for me, from my reading on game theory and stuff, it's like, why are economists so, some are so fascinated with game theory and then others are kind of out in la la land. And he says, it in, you know, he says in one, one the passage of the book at the end of, um, I want to say it was the bliss point or something, one of the um, chapters, it's, it's because of an um, arrow, uh, arrow and another another guy. Basically, the equations that they're coming up with, it kind of kills um, the general equilibrium theory. And um, it's not you're always uh, the other one was you're always going to have the shocks. That's one of the things of where it's embarrassing to say capitalism is booms and busts and the bus are going to be a lot of you going to be starving to death kind of thing. They want to say, no, 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 that's not the case. And his, his equation says, oh no, it's, it's, it's the case for sure. Um, and so a lot uh, gave up on the traditional. So, um, but yeah, I, I, would, would you consider a market as failing if, um, uh, the one of the scenarios is you have a Bill Gates and he has 99% of the money, like what, like a king. And then everyone else is a, um, a peasant or poor. That's an equilibrium. You can have an equilibrium like that. And they, that's an example presented in the book, but is it a market failure? But most of us was, I hesitate, I, you know, I, I think most of us will say, yeah. Uh, I will say this, people that are hardcore free market will, they, that's embarrassing to them. Uh, that a, a situation where there's great, even using the phrase great inequality, I don't think it captures that scenario, but that scenario is an equilibrium and fits in a um, uh, free market um, model. So there you go. Anyone else? This was a very interesting read. Um... We don't have to go into it. Uh, we're about at time. But um, if you look at the bottom right, or I guess my screen, um, I outline just like, I, I use effectively like what Cassidy outlines or highlights and I just try to, you know, apply it to a micro approach of like a company and a co-op. Um, but um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I made everything up here on the fly and my proposed solution is there needed to be some type of 
regulation to keep this micro market afloat would be that would be my suggestion and um this is going to be meant more so for like conversation starter um someone else had like a different suggestion on the solution or um something like that but like i say you can just take that home with you <laughs> and think about it but um thanks everyone for joining today i hope you enjoyed it and um you can catch this recording and meet up before um, before you go can i yep. can i ask a quick meta question yeah no problem so I'm a, this is my first time. I'm I'm from Nova Web Development, a co-op in Arlington, Virginia. So okay. um, I don't I forget how I got on your mailing list, but so I was reaching out to fellow cooperators. So I, I've been meaning to attend one of these for a while. This is the first time I got to do it. What what's like is next week you're going to start talking about co-ops or what's the how, like. I, this was a good read, but I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what's the plan for what you do e each time you do this. Yeah, so um, my name is Watson. I'm one of the contributors to uh, this meetup and we're with Vault Co-op and we're also a cooperative, uh, software cooperative. Um, well, one of the goals is to go through the literature about economics and about software and to go ahead and critique it from the view, my way of looking at it is to critique it from a view of an organic, like if you wanted to form things organically with a bunch of, of your either friends or associates or however, and you come together to create a business, so software business, particularly, how would you do it? And most of the literature out there is going to be smart person on top, everyone else controlled by that person within the confines of a, you know, a business entity. And uh, which is funny because, you know, one of my things is uh, talking about how within a, the pure capital model, um, everything is free until you get inside the business or organization, and then it's uh, totalitarian, right? So we're more trying to critique things from how is it that we can have an entity that's democratic and uh, in some form or another, and then draw from how would how would you read any of the business literature that's out there? So in answer to your question, I think the next book we have been going through uh, The Worker Owned Firm by David Eller Ellerman. And we did the first part, what, three, two months ago. And people were requesting the second uh, part of it. Um, and uh, so we were gonna, I was gonna do that. That's one thing. Um, another thing is we, uh, we meet monthly, not every week, but, um, because uh, you sent you mentioned next week. Uh, oh yeah, that, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that that's really really the goal. And the other thing is we we have this really because we um we're going to talk about these issues. We always talk about these issues all the time when someone new comes in or some of our associates we're talking. We're always talking about these, and so you might as well do it in an, in a forum. You might as well. There's no way of getting away from it. So that's that's really the, the impetus for it. That answer right, your question? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Jeffrey, if 